Okay, um, so uh, my paper today will briefly uh, talk about uh, the Pavyak prison and the Jewish community of Warsaw, uh, in particular Jews in the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, the uh, Pavyak prison uh, became a symbol of, uh, of the Polish fate under Nazi occupation. It was uh, the Gestapo prison in Warsaw, with over 100,000 people who went through it, a large number of them ending up in concentration camp, and in uh, literature and also in the popular narrative during the Second World War, Pawiak was the symbol of Polish suffering. But what I want to show today is that it was also part of Jewish history of occupied Warsaw and became one of these places where both Polish and Jewish fate uh, met during the war. Um, and I think what, what my paper does is it really works with this current research and growing research on uh, German courts during uh, during the war in occupied Warsaw, which also shows how Poles and Jews were tried in front of the same tribunals. Uh, so it was one of these meeting spots of Poles and Jews during the war. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. We're troubling some difficulties here in the hall, but it's okay. We can hear you via Zoom. It's okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, this so Pavyak, Pavyak prison, located between Jelna Pavia and Vinjena Street, were also located firmly sure. in uh, in the Warsaw ghetto. It operated as a central German prison, Warsaw, between. Uh, October 1939, beginning of October, so just the beginning of occupation of Warsaw, until 21st of August 1944, so basically throughout the Nazi administration in Warsaw. From March 1940, it was the investigative prison of the security police and security service uh, of Warsaw. The uh, Pavyak, as I said, almost immediately became the symbol of the oppression of Poles in Warsaw, the symbol of Nazi threat. Uh, and uh, But there's no doubt that Pavyak played a crucial role also in the Warsaw ghetto. It um, played an important role in the topography of the Warsaw ghetto. The four-story prison on Pavia Street occupied, let me show you a picture of it, occupied an era of uh, area of around 1.5 hectares. It was surrounded by, by a wall with additional barbed wire on top of it and guard towers fitted with machine guns. The area around Pavyak was uh, patrolled by, uh, by the Germans and transports from Pavyak because prisoners from Pavyak were interrogated at uh, the Gestapo seat at, uh, at Shucha Street, at Alea Shucha, so the, the transports from Pavyak were going through the ghetto every day, transporting prisoners back and from uh, from interrogation. So we can see that say that aside from uh, from ghetto gates, it was Pavyak that became the most visible sign of uh, of German presence in the ghetto, at least until the spring of 1942. <laughs> Uh, this was true above all for residents of houses on the streets adjacent uh, adjacent to Pavyak. Uh, we can we can find from the diaries and and memoirs that the the building was uh, a source of physical danger to the population. As early as mid nineteen forty one, Jews living on the streets adjacent to Pavyak and Jelna were forced to cover the windows overlooking the prison. And Abraham Levin, one of the best known, uh, uh, best known uh, diarists from the Warsaw Ghetto, had a sister who was living uh, in Jelna. And Abraham Levin noted in his diaries following: "The Jews from Pavia and Jelna are going through perpetual hell. For a long time now, all windows of the flats overlooking Pavia and Jelna, that are opposite Paviak, have had to be hermetically closed and covered with black paper." 24 hours a day, like during compulsory blackouts at night. The four the Jewish front doors in the aforementioned streets are always dark and the flats can never be aired. It is probably superfluous to emphasize the toll that being in constant darkness and without fresh air, even ghetto air, takes on the eyesight, lungs and minds. 
where there's electricity, electric lights are on during the day. In many houses, however, electricity is turned off altogether. Its supply is severely restricted. And so they sit there all day in the dark. The fate of all, uh, all they get in is harsh and bitter, but even worse and more unbearable is the fate of those who, to their misfortune, happen to live opposite Paviak. Breaking the, uh, bre breaking the blackout, as we know, provoked immediate reaction from guards at, at Paviak, with people being shot, for example, for going out uh, onto the balcony of the buildings. Uh, from April and May 1942, when the German terror intensified in the ghetto and had actual cases of, of people being executed in, in, uh, by Germans in, on the ghetto streets, uh, Paviak became a, a threat to a larger group of inhabitants. From that time, people were taken from the streets of the ghetto to Paviak uh, to be tortured. Commenting on this uh, situation, Chaim Kapwan, another incredibly famous, very famous uh, diarist from the Wuso ghetto, wrote, we know a basic rule. All those who are led to Paviak are being led to slaughter. The victims were dragged out of the houses in the vicinity of Paviak or selected from among passerbys. Emanuel Ringelblum wrote in May 1942, Gestapo officers from Paviak need new victims every day. Just as pious Jews feel bad to, to miss a day's prayer, they cannot pass a day without breaking the bones of a few Jews caught in the street. At the same time, prisoners from Paviak, both Poles and non-Jewish, uh, both Jews and non-Jewish Poles were being executed in the ghetto and uh, their bodies were, were found in the doorways of houses neighboring the prison. We know that they were later buried in graves in the Jewish cemetery. So this incident definitely contributed to the vision of Paviak as a source of, of mortal danger. But nonetheless, we do not come across in the ghetto diaries, as we do on, uh, on, in diaries of non-Jewish Poles, uh, the vision of Paviak as a symbol, as a symbol of martyrdom of, uh, of the city under Nazi, Nazi occupation. Even though residents of the ghetto were aware, like Isaac Zuckerman wrote of the quote-unquote romantic legend of the place, uh, most of them saw Paviak as the place where above all Poles were being tortured. So while the ghetto was seen as the manifestation of the Jewish martyrdom, uh, Paviak and Auschwitz at that point, especially from the point of view of Warsaw Jews, were seen as uh, places of Polish martyrdom, at least in the in the initial initial period. Uh, it is also important that residents of the ghetto, as I already said, saw prisoners from Paviak being transported to and from the uh, from the uh, from the prison, and saw the helplessness of those people who were who were being uh, being taken to uh, to Paviak. One of the diaries from the Warsaw ghetto referred to them in the spring of 1942. That's a diary from the Regal Archive as, and I quote, lambs being led to slaughter. And I think it's very interesting that someone writing from within the ghetto in May 42 writes about Poles being taken to prison as lambs being uh, led to slaughter. At the same time, and that's also something that others noted, the very existence of Paviak, which at least pretended to act as some symbol of justice, uh, serve as a, as a sign of a different fate of Poles and Jews. Poles had at least a semblance of justice in the form of Paviak. Jews did not have any, uh, any semblance of the rule of law. But of course, it doesn't mean that there were no Jews in Paviak. On the, other, on the contrary, there were Jews who were imprisoned in Paviak. And I have divided them uh, for the purpose of my research into several groups. Uh, the first one were those who were, um, who were arrested for the so-called common misdemeanors. So Ringelum Archive writes a list of, uh, of offenses for which people were detained in Paviak, especially in the early period before the detention center in, uh, in the ghetto was set up in the spring of 40, in the summer of 41. So among these offenses are stealing a bottle of vodka, lack of an armband, illegal trading, smuggling, or currency trading. A woman whose 
imprisoned in uh, in Paviak in this early stage, wrote that uh, women who were in her cell ranged from colonized women to prostitutes, to women from the provinces, from pious Hasidic homes, even those had been baptized. Until November 1940, so until the sealing of the ghetto, Poles and Jews were in the in the cells together in Paviak. Later on, they were in separate Jewish cells, which were at much worse conditions than Polish cells. The second group of, of Jews who were in Paviak were those who were there as who were uh, arrested on the basis of uh, of various lists, usually due to the social functions. So this includes Jews who were arrested in the beginning of uh, of the war together with uh, with Poles as, as members of the intelligentsia, and then those who were arrested in various actions against Jews, or important people from the community, including Józef Szaryński, who was the head of the Jewish Order Service, imprisoned in Paviak in May uh, 1942. Uh, the most famous groups were probably 60 prisoners, hostages, including members of the Judenrat who were imprisoned in July 1942 as part of the uh, as as part of the uh, as part of the uh, extermination action of the Warsaw, great big action in the Warsaw ghetto. The third group, and that's the group that's probably best known, are the so-called foreigners. So people who are imprisoned in Paviak with passports from United States, South, and Central American countries. There were three groups of foreigners in Paviak. The first one, sorry, it's... Uh, the first one were. Uh, were those arrested in April 1942. So inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto with foreign passports were taken to pra Paviak. Then uh, those in December 1942. And finally, those were cleared there as part of the Hotel Post about 95 people from, uh, from who went through Hotel Polski end up in Paviak. Some of them were transported to Bergen-Belsen and the remain remaining were uh, killed and executed. In, in Paviak. The third group, uh, and that's the biggest group, were those who were incarcerated in Paviak for usually a very brief period of time since the beginning of 1943, either as Jews who were outside, who were captured outside the ghetto, or as persons suspected of being, uh, of being Jewish. These people were, uh, were sent to the infamous seven for men or eight or nine uh, for women. Uh, these cells were referred to officially as, as the Jewish, as displaced Jewish cells, but in reality were, were referred to in Paviak as the Jewish death cells. Describing uh, cell number eight, so the, the cell for, uh, for Jewish women caught, caught outside the ghetto, uh, one female Paviak prisoner wrote, The cells on the side of the, of the corridor are isolation cells. Only number eight has several women, five, six, seven, depending on the day. A couple of sacks lying on the floor serve as bedding. In the corner is a stinking glue. In number eight, obligatory leaking. On the floor in the other corner of the cell are bowls of uneaten soup and rye bread where piece beaten off. You do not eat in number eight. You cannot eat. You read the names carved on the walls of people who went through these cells and were murdered. Another woman who was uh, also in prison, in, who was held in a cell adjacent to cell number eight, reported. Day and night, we would hear screams, moans, the sounds of beating, and the commands down, silence, and stop screaming, coming from cell eight, with one exception. The hour between 10 and 11 a.m., when those from number eight were led to be executed, by the heroic soldier of the Third Reich, who an hour later would fill in the hospitable cell walls with new victims. The Jews of Paviak, just like the Poles, were shot as, after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in mass executions in the ruins of the ghetto, and after being shot, the corpses were most likely burned. Possibly the most famous group to, went, to go through Paviak and through the Jewish death cells was Emanuel Rindelblum and those who were together with him uncovered in uh, in Bunker Krisha in March 1944. We know that they were uh, interned in Paviak for a short while, most likely a couple of days. And later on, they were murdered in, uh, like the others, in the, in the ruins 
of the ghetto. Of course, not all of those who were in Paviak, who were brought to Paviak as suspected of being Jewish, could immediately be proven to be Jewish. Uh, those whose identity was uncertain were placed in the so-called transit cells, where they waited often up to several months for their identity to be proved. Of course, this is mainly referring to women. Uh, their uh, situation was a bit better. The names were placed in the in the prison register, so we actually have their names, and uh, they were also getting uh, food parcels. One former Paviak prisoner describing cell two five eight which was the one next to 257 was the deaf cell, 258 was the so-called transit cell, uh, wrote as following. The 23 Jews came from the cross-section of various backgrounds. Among them were several long-standing Warsaw residents with names well known to Jews and non-Jews alike, a substantial number of intellectuals, doctors, lawyers, and engineers. Some of them had been converted to Christianity before the war. Other merely possessed false certificate of um, of baptism. As I already said, the situation of Jews in Paviak prison was substantially worse than already very bad situation with Poles. This is mainly because they did not have any extra uh, any extra food rations, even though the Jewish underground uh, and aid organizations attempted to, to provide them, uh, provide them for them. The only way they could improve their living was, was via taking uh, work. So be becoming functionary prisoners in, uh, in in the prison. One of the women who became a functionary prisoner and was working there cleaning the toilets recalled, this was very important for me, also from a subjective perspective. I did not have to sit in the cell all day. The atmosphere inside was such that I felt that my nerves wouldn't handle it. After all, it was a cell of convicts. In the cell, we saw hundreds of women just over a couple of months, only three are still alive. Uh, an important group of Jews, an often forgotten group of Jews were being held in Paviak, were those who were held as Poles. So people, again, especially women, who did not own up to the Polish identity. Um, we, uh, um, one of the women who was, uh, who was uh, interned in Paviak as a political prisoner and whose Jewish identity has not been discovered, wrote the following about her experience. I went through terrible times in Paviak, fearing that my origin might be revealed. All the more so when I was coming back from the interrogation in Ruha. I met a prisoner at the Paviak entrance, also a Pole, who knew me before the before the war as a uh, who knew me before the war as a Jewess. I was afraid that he might give me away. I was afraid that someone might recognize me and alert my oppressors. As a Pole, I could still hope to be saved. Otherwise, I would face certain death. Jews caught on the air inside were kept opposite, uh, opposite the cell where I was interned, and I suffered immensely seeing how they were treated and taken to execution. I felt it all with them. Those who did manage to hide their identity were usually taken to concentration camp with Poles and then further on the journey on hiding their identity continued. Um, to conclude this account of, of Jewish prisoners in, in Paviak and showing to what extent the story of Paviak, the sy symbol of Polish martyrdom, is also a Jewish story, I think it's important to see how Paviak was seen from the ghetto and how the ghetto was seen from Paviak. For uh, Polish prisoners in Paviak, ghetto saved as an extra layer of oppression. Hey, Selina, I'm sorry, you have five more minutes. Okay. How many? Five more minutes. Oh, it's fine. I'm four minutes. I have four minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, Paviak served as a as a symbol of an extra layer of of oppression, an extra layer of of distancing them from the city. Of course, before the ghetto was set up, people could, for example, uh, family members could come to Paviak, stand outside the windows. Parcels could be easily passed. Uh, once once the once the ghetto was sealed off, nobody could get there. Passing on parcels became more difficult. Escape through the ghetto at that point became, of course, almost impossible. But for the Jewish prisoners, the situation was uh, was even uh, even uh, more difficult. For them, the ghetto was not so much an obstacle to escape, but was a place where the family members were still living. 
Oh, how I envied residents, one of Pawiak's Jewish prisoners wrote in March 1943. People who were in prison in Pawiak spoke about, uh, about the sound of the tram, about children's voices, which they could hear in the, in the prison. And one of female prisoners wrote that thanks to sounds of the city coming from the ghetto, she felt one step away from freedom. At the same time, Jewish prisoners were differently affected by tragic events in the ghetto, which they witnessed from the windows of the, of the prison. In dramatic fragment of her, of her diary, teenage Mary Berg, who was interned in Pawiak as a foreigner, wrote, Behind the Pawiak gate, we are all experiencing the terror that's abroad, that's in the ghetto. For the last few nights, we have been unable to sleep. The noise of the shooting, the cries of despair are driving us crazy. I have to summon all my strength to write these notes. I have lost count of these days, and I do not know what day it is. But what does it matter? We are here on a little island amidst the ocean of blood. The whole ghetto is drowning in blood. We literally see human blood. We can smell it. I cannot go on living. My strength is exhausted. How long are we going to get here with to all that? Uh, long after, uh, after the fall, later after the fall of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, prisoners from Pawiak, of course, witnessed the last stage of life of Jews and death of Jews in occupied Warsaw. So hunting for Jews in uh, in the ruins of the ghetto. So the presentation was basically an introduction to this topic and also showing that there are aspects of, I think, joint Polish Jewish history in, in the history of Warsaw and occupied Warsaw, which still, uh, I think, deserve to be researched and which are being researched and which also show us how this narrative uh, can uh, connect in, in the story of, of the Holocaust in Warsaw. Thank you.